Welcome to today's Wednesday afternoon lecture series presentation. Uh, my name is Matthias Machner. Um, I'm the chief of the section on microbial pathogenesis of NICHD. And on behalf of all members of the protein trafficking and organelle dynamics interest group, I would like to welcome back to the NIH um, today's wall speaker, our friend and former colleague, Dr. Manu Hegde. So I'm sure many of you remember Manu from his time at NIH, first as a member of the NCI Scholars Program, and then later starting uh, in 2002 as an investigator in what was formerly known as the Cell Biology Metabolism branch of NICHD, NHD, NICHD the same program that I joined a few years later. Uh, Manu received tenure in 2008, and in 2011, sadly, he moved his laboratory to the University of Cambridge in England to join the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where he has been since then. So Manu is an absolute leader in the field of protein quality control. Throughout his career, he has been at the forefront of studying the lives of proteins, in particular membrane proteins, from the moment they are synthesized or born at the ribosome to how they are delivered to their final destination compartment within cells and how cells recognize errors that, if not corrected, would significantly impact human health. Uh, Manu's contributions to the field of protein biogenesis and quality control are exceptional in their originality, and his more than 130 publications today are evidence that he's in a class of his own, really. So fun fact is Manu sent us his CV. It was 13 pages long, and the publication record covered 11 of those 13 pages. Um, so what I think makes Manu really a truly outstanding scientist is his instinct for important biological questions and his cleverness in developing elegant experimental approaches to find the correct answer. Many of the discoveries that Manu has made over the years are what one might consider instant classics, the kind of work that uh, students will read about in textbooks. The impact of Manu's work has not gone unnoticed by the larger scientific community, and he has received numerous honors and awards, including the Eduard Buchner Prize from the German Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and his election as EMBO member in 2013 and a, f and, uh, a fellow of the Royal Society in 2016. Uh, Manu received his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago in 1991, and his PhD degree and MD degree from the University of California in San Francisco in 1997 and 1999, respectively. And since then, he has shaped the field of protein biochemistry and cell biology not only through his marvelous research, but also by mentoring over 55 trainees, including many students and postdocs. So again, we are fortunate to have Manu here today. Please join me in welcoming back to the NIH, Dr. Manu Hector. Well, first of all, um, thanks to Matthias for a generous introduction and also for um, arranging a trip, sort of a welcoming home, if you will, uh, to the NIH. Um, it is, in fact, the first time I've come back here since I left about 12 years ago, and um, it's been great to catch up with uh, a number of my colleagues here. So um, before I begin, uh, I will just mention that um, this is my group, uh, obviously during the, the kind of midst of the pandemic. And uh, some of the more recent work that I'll talk about was done by a PhD student, Luca, and a postdoc, a former postdoc, Min. Um, and then a lot of our work on membrane protein biogenesis was uh, and continues to be done in collaboration with the lab of Bob Keenan at the University of Chicago. Um, I should disclose that I'm a paid consultant for gate bioscience, which develops inhibitors of, of protein secretion. So we work on a number of different things, protein quality control, membrane protein insertion, and so forth. And I decided I wanted to talk about membrane protein insertion because some of the new insights we have, I think, are, are exciting to me. Now, the field of membrane proteins goes back quite a ways. Obviously, all life is composed of cells that have a limiting membrane. And that membrane allows all the biochemical reactions of life to be inside the cell and separated from the extracellular environment. But if you want to communicate information across that membrane or move anything across that membrane, nutrients, metabolites, um, you need proteins embedded in the membrane. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago, well, by certain metrics, that 
Membrane proteins were appreciated to actually span the lipid bilayer. So in some really elegant experiments by Mark Brecher, who was at the LMB, um, Ted Steck at the University of Chicago, they demonstrated that the membrane of the red blood cell, in fact, has proteins that can span the bilayer. And the lipid bilayer, obviously, is very hydrophobic. And so what was appreciated right then at that point was that the parts that are embedded in the bilayer must be very hydrophobic. And what this tells us, in fact, is that these proteins, which are obviously synthesized in the aqueous compartment by ribosomes, um, already pose a problem of how they wind up getting embedded in this greasy lipid bilayer. And although these membrane proteins initially were, it was completely unclear what they look like, we obviously now have structures of what membrane proteins look like. So for example, the glucose transporter is weaved back and forth across the lipid bilayer many times, and the parts of it that face the membrane are very hydrophobic. So the question then arises, how does the cell put these proteins in the lipid bilayer? And it's an important problem because membrane proteins compose about 20% of the genome, and they perform all of these very fundamental processes, such as transport of nutrients. And so we got interested in this a number of years ago. And the earliest insight into how this might happen, how do you get a hydrophobic protein that's essentially insoluble in aqueous solvents into the bilayer, comes from electron microscopy. So this goes back way to the 1950s and 60s. And what you can see here in this electron micrograph is that you have a bunch of ribosomes, which are these dark black dots, bound tightly to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. And these ribosomes are in the process of synthesizing secreted and membrane proteins. And so the idea, the earliest idea, is that these secreted membrane proteins, membrane proteins in particular, have lots of hydrophobic segments. And those hydrophobic segments, by synthesizing them very close to the membrane, would spontaneously embed into the lipid bilayer. And in the case of a secretory protein, the insertion of that hydrophobic part into the bilayer would drag an adjacent part of hydrophilic polypeptide across an otherwise impermeable bilayer. Now, the energetics of this didn't quite make sense to some people, and particularly Gunter Blobel really felt strongly that the movement of hydrophilic polypeptide across the membrane must go through a channel. And so around 1980 or so, Blobel proposed that the way a membrane protein gets made is that you have these hydrophobic segments of polypeptide that come out of the ribosome, and they're sequentially inserted into the lipid bilayer through some type of channel. And so, you know, when I was a graduate student, I uh, wrote a review on how membrane proteins get made. And of course, the picture hadn't changed at all in the 17 years since Blobel originally proposed this idea and when I wrote this review. So the idea is that a ribosome is docked at a translocation channel or a translocon, and that as hydrophobic segments, these little black bars, come out of the ribosome, they would move out of this translocon into the bilayer, and once you've done this sequentially over and over for, in this case, seven transmembrane segments, then you finish translation and then the protein folds. And so what really advanced things forward was, of course, the identity of this translocon, and the central component of it arose from a combination of yeast and, yeast and bacterial genetics and biochemistry. And then a real advance was to get the structure of an archaeal version of this. And this was accomplished by Tom Rappaport and colleagues in, in 2004 or so. And although the, the, the protein wasn't actually in the process of translocation, um, what one could see is that the structure is sort of a cylinder, and the cylinder with a little bit of conformational change could conceivably open across the membrane for secretion and open into the lipid bilayer through this lateral gate for insertion of, of hydrophobic elements. And that idea basically turns out to be true, and one of our contributions was to leverage advances in cryo-EM to stage the process of, of insertion of a hydrophobic segment before and after it engages this SEC61 translocation channel and one can then kind of see how this might work. So this is just a morph between an inactive and an active version of SEC61. Active meaning it is engaged by a hydrophobic segment, in this case a hydrophobic signal peptide, that as predicted originally from biochemical and structural work is sitting at this lateral gate. And in order to sit there, 
um, half of the molecule moves apart from the other half. And in that process, the central orifice of this, of this channel opens. So what you then have in this type of picture of how this translocation channel works is that you have a hydrophobic segment of polypeptide that engages the lateral part of this channel, dragging the hydrophilic segment of polypeptide downstream of it. And then at a later step, one would imagine that this hydrophobic part moves into the lipid bilayer and the hydrophilic part goes across the membrane through this channel. And so you can imagine then, and again, I, I emphasize the fact that it, it, it really is a, is a working model of how you would then have as more and more hydrophobic segments come out of the ribosome, they would all do exactly the same thing. So you insert them all one by one through this lateral gate of the SEC61 channel. And that's the kind of working model that you'll see in any reviewer textbook. Now, that makes a lot of sense, and there's good reasons why this model has been extremely durable. Um, but when you look at a real membrane protein, so to speak, as opposed to models, you start to see some problems. So what I've depicted here is a G-protein coupled receptor, the beta adrenergic receptor. And what you can see is that when the protein is finally made, and this is a, this is a, a structure of it, um, the hydrophobic parts of the polypeptide are in the membrane and, and all the hydrophobic surfaces face the lipid bilayer. So here hydrophobic is colored red. But the interior of that is filled with lots of hydrophilic, polypep uh, hydrophilic amino acids. And those, of course, are functionally important for things like binding to ligands, in this case, adrenaline. And so if you look at a kind of a deconstructed version of this, you can see that the individual segments of polypeptide that span the membrane are highly variable. So some of them are remarkably hydrophilic, like this third transmembrane segment. And in fact, if you take these individual transmembrane segments and test whether they can engage SEC61 and insert into the lipid bilayer, it turns out several of them don't. So like three out of seven of these don't. And in many, many multi-pass membrane proteins, at around half of the membrane protein segments, in fact, can't engage SEC61 when tested in a model system. So then that raises the problem of how these segments actually get inserted. The second problem of hydrophilic parts of a protein like this in the membrane is these proteins are synthesized co-translationally and inserted co-translationally. Translation is relatively slow. So you make about five or six amino acids a second. So a 350 amino acid protein like this is gonna take you know, 70 seconds or so to get made. And that means that the first parts of the protein are waiting around for quite a long time. And I remind you that on the, on the scale of molecular dynamics, uh, you know, tens of seconds is an enormity. I mean, that is a very long time. So how are these hydrophilic segments of the polypeptide um, stabilized until you make the rest of the protein and then it can fold properly into the final structure? So those are the two problems that really puzzled us and that we decided we wanted to have an answer to. So quite a long time ago, we and, and various other people, of course, um, had tried to understand this, and one classic approach is to take a biochemical strategy. And the approach here is to take a crude extract um, that can synthesize proteins. So in this case, it's a, an extract made from reticulocyte lysate. And you can add to it an mRNA that codes for the protein you're interested in, for example, RGPCR. And in the presence of ER vesicles, the idea is that that would get synthesized and get inserted into that ER and then you could work out in some way um, how this process happened. So here's an experiment with a GPCR. So if you translate the protein in the absence of ER membranes in this in vitro reaction, you produce a product that codes for the, G, that, that codes for the GPCR, in this case, beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And when you compare it to the same reaction, but in the presence of ER membranes, you can see that the polypeptide, a fair amount of it, shifts to this higher molecular weight. And that turns out is glycosylation, and that tells you that at least the beginning part of the protein got inserted into the lipid bilayer. We did a bunch of experiments to show that the other parts were also inserted, but perhaps the most convincing experiment is to show that the final product here can bind ligand. That's because binding ligand is a very rigorous test that it has not only been inserted, but folded correctly. And sure enough, if you immobilize a ligand for this class of receptors on, on some beads and you do a pull down, 
I think you can appreciate that only the inserted and glycosylated population gets pulled out. So what this tells you is that in this in vitro reaction, even though it doesn't necessarily work to 100% efficiency, all the components that are needed to synthesize the protein, take the ribosome to the ER, insert all the transmembrane segments and fold it correctly exist. So it tells us that this is at least a complete system and the trick now is to figure out what's involved. Now I have to say we face two big problems. The first is how do you actually find the factors of a process that occurs co-translationally and is very dynamic. The second and logistically more challenging problem is how do you convince somebody to look for factors when all of the textbooks tell you that everything is already known, right? And um, here uh, we basically were stumped, right? So it was difficult to, to, to kind of convince people to work on this and of course we didn't have great ideas for how to figure this out. And it's at this point where I'm reminded of a book that I was given by my dad when I was growing up. And it's this book called How to Solve It. And it's actually a mathematics book. My father was a mathematician. Um, and it's how to solve mathematical problems. And one of the key principles in this book is if you can't solve the problem you're interested in, try to solve a simpler related problem. And the hope is that if the problem is related enough, insights from the simpler version of the problem will, of course, give you uh, some toehold into the problem that will help you solve the, the, the more complicated one. We, of course, use this all the time. This is the basis of model systems. This is why we make simple versions of constructs and so forth. But it's worth reminding, uh, reminding ourselves once in a while. So if you look at membrane proteins as a whole, they come in lots of varieties and flavors, right? So there are a couple different uh, types labeled here. Uh, at like the GPCRs in the middle, ABC transporters, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, and so forth. And a number of years ago, um, we got interested in, in understanding how this very small and simple class of proteins get made. Um, these are called tail-anchored proteins, and a very important subset of them are, are snare proteins that are involved in protein trafficking. And they have a single transmembrane segment, and it wasn't clear how they get targeted to the membrane and inserted. And although it might seem like solving that problem would give us insight into these others was, was a bit fanciful, that in fact turns out to be the case, and I'm going to explain to you why. So this goes back quite a many, many years now, but um, how this works was really unclear. And what we did was we searched for factors that recognize this hydrophobic transmembrane segment and deliver the protein to the, to the membrane where it needs to be inserted. And using a biochemical strategy, we identified a factor in mammalian cells, um, which is an ATPase that's very widely conserved. And it seems to be the targeting factor, that is the factor that delivers it to the ER for insertion. And the reason this was an important advance is because once you know the first component of any pathway, you can then apply lots of other tools, genetic tools, uh, biochemical tools for interaction partners and so forth to work out the rest of the pathway. And although I won't go into the details, we now have a very uh, complete picture of how this works, including structures reconstituted with purified components and so forth. But one of the key insights is that at the membrane, the receptor for this targeting factor is a two-protein complex that releases the, the, the substrate from this targeting factor and then facilitates its insertion into the bilayer. And the reason this was, this was important to understand, and these are the, the names of the yeast proteins, uh, GET1, GET2, and GET3. And I should say that a number of different groups around the world contributed to working out this pathway, um, is that these two proteins, uh, although it was initially difficult to find homologs of it, um, with better methods of searching, such as structure-based methods like HHPRED, we could appreciate that there were homologs in the ER. So in the mammalian ER, there were two other uh, homologs. Two of them were the central part of a much larger complex called EMC, and the subunits were EMC3 and 6, which are homologous to the GET1, GET2. And then there was a very poorly understood uh, pair of proteins that uh, later were shown to form a complex, and um, that we named the gel complex, and I'll come back to that. So of course, if this is an insertion factor for inserting a transmembrane segment into the bilayer. 
it stands to reason that these others might have a similar function if they're structurally similar. And so um, we, my lab, uh, decided to, to, to investigate this for EMC, and then our collaborator Bob Keenan uh, went to work trying to study what this other complex, the gel complex, uh, does. And this winds up converging a bit later. So what we found, the, the other important thing to say, I should, I should go back here, is that these are the mammalian proteins and names, but it turns out that a really important insight from this kind of bioinformatic analysis is that it appeared that the GET1 was related to a bacterial protein. And the bacterial protein is a protein called YIDC. And this sort of linked now components that were in, in, in bacteria with components in eukaryotes. And it sort of seemed like this was a very universal family, and it's now known as the OXA1 family. And the nomenclature here is terrible, but it's not that important for our discussion. But what's known it, from studying this OXA1 family is that the E. coli protein, for example, looks like this, and this is a really beautiful structure from the Nureki lab. And the way it mediates transmembrane domain insertion is hypothesized to be the following. Remember that at the beginning, I mentioned that hydrophobic domains like a transmembrane segment, this red part, will spontaneously insert into the lipid bilayer. But the energetic barrier to this is the translocation of the hydrophilic part across the membrane. So the energy gained by partitioning this hydrophobic part into the membrane is thought to offset the translocation of the hydrophilic part. And what this factor does is it reduces the, the, the energy barrier for the translocation of the hydrophilic part. And the idea for how it does it is that the protein is structured in such a way that it has this, this vestibule that goes part of the way across the membrane. So you can sort of imagine that near that vestibule, the lipid bilayer is going to be a bit thinner. And so it reduces the barrier to translocation, which facilitates this insertion reaction. That's the idea. And I think there's reasonable support for it, but obviously uh, kind of rigorous proof for this is, is uh, still awaits for more studies. And so EMC, it turns out, mediates this reaction, and we were able to show this. And we could show this in a couple of different contexts, but the one that's important for uh, GPCRs is that we could show it does the job for the very first transmembrane segment of the protein. And so uh, Patrick Chitwood, a student in the lab, could show that EMC is required to efficiently insert this first transmembrane segment into the lipid bilayer as long as the part that goes across the membrane is relatively short, which is the case for about 90% of GPCRs. And so this is one experiment that demonstrates this, where we made cell lines that are lacking EMC by deleting one of the subunits. And this is a flow cytometry assay that measures how much of the beta-1 adrenergic receptor gets produced in this assay. And you can see that um, in the production of this is reduced by about 50% in EMC knockouts, and that can be rescued by reintroducing uh, the complex back into the cells. And we could reconstitute this with purified components and show that EMC was completely sufficient for this. And later studies could mutate uh, by us and others, could mutate certain residues here to get some insight into how this works. So what then emerged is that EMC mediates the insertion of the first transmembrane segment of a, of a GPCR, for example. And then the ribosome, it turns out, docks on the SEC61 channel, and that's where some additional stuff happens. Now, this was important for a couple of reasons, but the first, uh, obviously, it was important to assign a function to EMC. It was important for kind of uh, getting some insight into how GPCRs get made, but it was actually much more important, I would argue, for illustrating that SEC61 is not the only component that does everything. I think that if you would have asked anyone, they would have said that this transmembrane domain is inserted by SEC61, but now we have inhibitors that block the, that lateral gate of SEC61, and these transmembrane segments get inserted perfectly fine in the presence of those inhibitors. And that psychologically changed quite a bit, right? It allowed for the possibility that there were factors, despite this field having existed for decades, that there were factors we didn't know about. And that made it much easier for us to be motivated to find additional components. And so the next question was, well, after you get that first transmembrane segment inserted, what then happens? 
And what we speculated is that, remember that many of these hydrophobic segments are peppered with hydrophilic residues. So we speculated that there must be a chaperone of some type that temporarily stabilizes these intermediates while you synthesize the rest of the protein and until it folds correctly. This is analogous, in fact, to chaperones in the cytosol where these chaperones bind to partially synthesized proteins until you fold the whole thing, until you make the whole protein and then eventually fold. And of course, chaperones in the membrane would make a lot of sense, but we didn't know what they were. So Patrick, kind of motivated by uh, the, the possibility of additional factors, um, used a cross-linking strategy to identify such chaperones. And the experiment is a fairly straightforward one. Um, he used this in vitro uh, translation system to synthesize a protein up to the point where the first transmembrane segment had been synthesized and inserted, um, but no further. And there are some tricks one can use it by in, in in vitro translation to, to generate such a stalled intermediate using a truncated mRNA that doesn't have a stop codon. And then what one can ask is, what is adjacent to this transmembrane segment? And initially, this was done using cysteine reactive crosslinking. That's what this little uh, yellow circle is. Um, but later, we could also show this using uh, site-specific photo crosslinking using photoreactive amino acids. So the experiment's beautiful in its simplicity. Um, one assembles this intermediate with or without the cysteine in this transmembrane segment, and then adds a cysteine reactive crosslinker. And what one can see is that there is a very prominent unknown crosslink um, that crosslinks to our glycosylated, that is, inserted transmembrane segment. Um, you also see some crosslinks to SEC61, which we know is nearby. And so it took us a little while to figure out what this crosslink is. We scaled up, did mass spec. And although we didn't initially identify the, the crosslink, um, we identified a partner that it was associated with and then used the partner to figure out what the, what the complex was. And it turns out that it crosslinks to a two-protein complex via the small subunit of it. The small subunit is a protein called Asterix, and the large subunit is a, is a protein called CCDC47. And the function of neither was known at the time. But what we could show by this crosslinking is it's adjacent to a transmembrane segment that has just been inserted into the lipid bilayer. And obviously, uh, um, it, 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 its function wasn't clear. What we could further show is that if we move that crosslinker, for example, a photo crosslinker, to various positions along the polypeptide, crosslinks are seen only when the crosslinker is in the transmembrane segment. So it's obviously recognizing the transmembrane segment in the lipid bilayer, which is obviously the kind of protein we were looking for, a, a, a chaperone in the membrane. The second thing is that first transmembrane segment, it turns out, has a couple of hydrophilic residues. And if you change those hydrophilic residues to hydrophobic residues, then you no longer see this interaction. And if you put hydrophilic residues in other parts of the transmembrane segment, you can get back the interaction. So what we learned from that is that this factor is recognizing transmembrane segments in the lipid bilayer via partial hydrophilicity. So that helps a little bit with understanding how these partially hydrophilic transmembrane segments might be stabilized in the lipid bilayer until you make the rest of the protein. So this complex, it turns out, is conserved in, in, in all eukaryotes. If you knock it out, um, the cells are still alive and, as our yeast, but um, it seems to cause ER stress, which is what you would expect for protein folding problems if you can't um, assemble membrane proteins correctly. Um, knockout of CCDC47 in mouse is, is embryonic lethal. Um, and there are point mutants in, in this protein CCDC47 that have been described in humans, presumably hypomorphic alleles, that lead to kind of very complex neurodevelopmental phenotypes. So, it appears to be an important, very widely conserved complex, and it's quite abundant in the ER, um, slightly less abundant than SEC61, so about half its abundance. So that's a good sign. And then in functional experiments, um, using, again, our flow cytometry assay, it seems to reduce the biogenesis of multi-pass membrane proteins. A couple of different classes of proteins are shown here but not single-pass membrane proteins. Remember that this class is the one we started with. It depends on a protein called um, the GET pathway. And so uh, 
the uh, multi-pass proteins are selectively affected, and that also makes sense for the kind of factors we're looking for. So what we're then, of course, uh, left with at this point is that there is some factor that engages the early parts of a membrane protein, and then we could show in experiments I'm not showing you that it seems to remain associated, or at least nearby, until you make the rest of the protein, and then once the protein folds, it's no longer associated. So that kind of fits the idea that it is some type of chaperone that operates inside the membrane. And it seems to do so, it's not an energy-dependent factor, it seems to do, to do so simply by binding exposed hydrophilicity in the membrane, okay? So that was the working model, and the question then is, how does it actually work? Like, what, what does it look like, and so forth? So, um, Luca, a student, a PhD student in the lab, decided to investigate this. And what she decided to do was to first ask, when is it stably recruited to the ribosome translocon complex? So she assembled intermediates, just like I showed you in the earlier experiments, of different lengths. So two lengths are shown here. In the first one, the, the transmembrane segment has just been inserted. In the second one, it's been inserted, and a little bit more polypeptide has been synthesized. So the second transmembrane segment is now coming out of the ribosome. And you can then affinity purify each of these sequential intermediates and then analyze them by mass spec, blotting, and so forth. So shown is an experiment like that where we have increasing lengths of polypeptide downstream of the first transmembrane segment. And I think what you can appreciate is that all of them associate, of course, with the ribosome, which is what's synthesizing these proteins, and with the SEC61 complex which, to which the ribosome is docked. But the PAC complex is only recruited after you make a certain amount of polypeptide. And in this experiment, one has solubilized the membrane and affinity purified it. So what that tells you is that at this length here, where, we, where it first recruits the PAC complex, that is evidently a fairly stable complex. There's no cross-linking or anything here. It's been stably recruited to the, to the translocon. And what that means is that one can then analyze it by single particle cryo-EM. So, that's what uh, a, another member of the lab, Min, uh, decided to do. And I have to say, initially, it was rather disappointing because although we could get good uh, density for the SEC61 complex, which is green here, and some uh, other parts of, of what's associated, and certainly the ribosome was at high resolution, the part we're really interested in, which is the PAC complex, the part that's next to the ribosome is well, well ordered, but the part that's in the membrane was rather blobby. Right? So you can't really see much there. And it's at this point where um, AlphaFold is published. And AlphaFold, it turns out, is particularly good at predicting the structures of membrane proteins. And so you, an asterisk is a tiny protein. It's only about 10 kilodaltons. And this other protein, CCDC47, is bigger. But you put these proteins into AlphaFold, it predicts a beautiful structure, and more importantly, you put them together and it predicts a structure of the complex that happens to fit really nicely into this density, right? So you have kind of a short, a small three helix bundle of this asterisk protein uh, adjacent to which is the single transmembrane domain of CCDC47, this large globular domain, and then other parts of it that bind the ribosome. And it's important, of course, to know that this is some semblance of reality as opposed to a complete artifact. But um, of course, fitting into this low resolution density was a good start. So what Luca did was she put photo crosslinkers in different parts of Asterix. So she, essentially, she reconstituted Asterix knockout cells with versions in which one used amber suppression to put a photo crosslinker in any one location. So here's an experiment in which I'm comparing a photo crosslinker at position 42 versus 62. Uh, which is shown by this uh, red and blue star. And then you irradiate with UV light, and what one can see is this is the asterisk at the bottom of the gel, and in a UV-dependent manner, you see this additional band, which can be immunoprecipitated with antibodies against CCDC47. So what this band represents is a crosslink between CCDC47 and asterisk, as would be expected from the structural model. The other one, of course, doesn't cross-link to CCDC47. It's on the other side of the molecule. So she does this by placing the, the photo cross-linking probe in about a dozen different places in different parts of the protein. Thankfully for Luca, it's a very small protein. 
Um, and so we can, one, verify which part is adjacent to CCDC 47, and that really nicely validates the AlphaFold alpha model. And two, we can then find that this part of the pro, uh, this part of uh, uh, asterisk is the part that s recognizes substrate. So, knowing kind of that this is a reasonably plausible model, a structural model, what do we learn from this? The first problem is that here's the lateral gate of SEC 61. It's closed. So. Although this complex is in the process of making a membrane protein, and you might imagine that the membrane protein would get inserted via the lateral gate, that isn't what's happening here. In fact, the complex, the chaperone complex, the PAC complex, is not located near the lateral gate. It's located behind SEC61 and quite far away. So that's kind of puzzling, right? You would expect a chaperone to maybe capture membrane proteins as they come out of this X61 translocon if that's what's happening, and, and, and this doesn't make sense with that. Okay, but now if you have a closer look at Asterix, some things do make sense. So this is the surface of Asterix that, by crosslinking, engages substrate. And one thing you see is that it's highly conserved. So purple is con conserved here. The backside, which isn't shown here, is not very well conserved, but the part that binds substrate is conserved. And second, it's surprisingly hydrophilic. And that makes sense because remember I told you that the job of this protein, at least biochemically, is to recognize hydrophilic transmembrane segments, and so having a hydrophilic surface seems to make sense. And I won't show you the data, but if you mutate uh, this surface to make it less hydrophilic, then it no longer engages substrate. So, the hydrophilicity here is important for engaging substrate. Um, there's another curious thing, which is many of the hydrophobic surfaces here are made up of methionines. And this is interesting for the aficionados because many proteins involved in transmembrane domain recognition are methionine rich, and that seems to be a, a feature here of this protein as well. And it's thought that part of the reason is because the methionine is the most flexible hydrophobic side chain, and so maybe it can accommodate a wide range of sequences through that uh, property. Okay, so what we learn then from this structure is um, that the asterisk has a substrate binding region that engages partially hydrophilic substrates. But the parts that are really puzzling are, it does so behind SEC61. So what it means is that the polypeptide is rerouted over here to the left in the screen, away from the lateral gate. And in the conventional model of how membrane insertion should work, this next transmembrane segment needs to engage the lateral gate, and but it's being pulled away. So that is really puzzling. And as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, Aaron, a student in the lab, happened to be looking at our structure, and he said, guys, there's another problem. And that's because the CCDC47, you can see this, this kind of uh, pink-colored polypeptide, uh, sits very close to SEC61. And what Aaron noticed is that that part of CCDC47 is wedged between SEC61 and the ribosome. I think you can appreciate in this space-filling model that it is a tight fit. And the consequence of that is that SEC61 cannot open. So I'm just showing you again what the movie of SEC61 opening looks like. And I think you can appreciate, this is the same view here, that this kind of movement simply cannot happen when this wedge is sitting here. So what then has happened is that when you recruit the PAC complex, you wedge SEC61 to a closed conformation and you pull the substrate away from the lateral gate. And so that is not conducive to inserting the next transmembrane segment into the lateral gate of SEC61, as the conventional model would have you believe. And so we then thought about this for a while, and the only plausible model we could come up with is that as you elongate more, you then make the next transmembrane segment. So now you have two transmembrane segments that would then insert as a pair into the space behind SEC61 between the chaperone and, and the back of SEC61. And so the question is, is that a plausible scenario? And if it is, then is there machinery that catalyzes that reaction? And so um, I will tell you that, uh, that uh, it is a plausible scenario in that, for example, 
this loop between those two transmembrane segments, if you put a folded domain there, then this insertion reaction, in fact, doesn't work very efficiently. So it does suggest, in fact, that that's, that might be what's happening. Um, but to figure out what was going on, we then isolated these intermediates at the point where the next two transmembrane segments would be inserting. And then Affinity purified it, did mass spec, various blotting experiments in cryo-EM to try to see what was going on. And this turns out to be revealing. So this is a complicated slide with a fairly uh, simple conclusion. This is a mass spec experiment where we're comparing an early intermediate where the first transmembrane segment has just been inserted but the PAC complex has not yet been recruited compared to a late intermediate where the PAC complex has been recruited and the next two transmembrane segments are, are right about the point where they're inserting in the bilayer. And by comparing these two complexes using quantitative mass spec, there are only a handful of proteins that are enriched in the late complex. One of them, and all of them turn out to be parts of larger complexes that uh, our lab and Bob Keenan's lab characterized. So here's our friend, CCDC47. That's part of the PAC complex. So this is a blot verifying that it's recruited to the late complex here. Um, Asterix, it turns out, is not identified very efficiently by, by mass spec because it has very few triptych peptides. Similarly, the, this protein Nikalin and Nomo are part of a complex with a third protein called TMEM147, which also is not identified very well by mass spec, but is a part of an obligate complex. And we called this the back of SEC61 complex, or BOSS complex, because we have no idea what it does, but we know where it is. The third one is the most interesting, which is a two-protein complex composed of TMC01 and its interaction partner. And this is the complex that I mentioned briefly at the beginning, which is it is homologous to the GET complex, which is mediating transmembrane domain insertion, and EMC, which is also mediating transmembrane domain insertion. So we call it the gel complex for GET and EMC-like. And by homology, this factor seems like it would be mediating transmembrane domain insertion. So we have these three complexes here. Um, really nice work from the Keenan lab has shown that these are three independent complexes that are assembled together on the ribosome, but they, but they otherwise don't interact with each other. So one can, of course, then analyze this by EM. The resolution, again, is rather meager. However, the ability to dock in reasonably good predictions is, uh, is, is very good, and so uh, what you're looking at here is the view of this translocon, which we call the multipass translocon, from the lumen of the ER. So you're looking towards the ribosome, and the protein that, that's being synthesized is, is coming out of the ribosome towards you. And what we wind up seeing is the third transmembrane domain of the inserting polypeptide, but we can't see the other two. However, we can deduce which parts of the, of the substrate is adjacent to these other complexes using photocrosslinking. And that's shown in the experiment here on the right, where we put a photocrosslinking probe in the first transmembrane segment, the second transmembrane segment, or two different sites of the third transmembrane segment. And then you irradiate with UV light. And what you can see is that here's a crosslink to the first transmembrane segment, the primary, the primary crosslink. And that turns out to be asterisk. I I'm not showing you the IPs here, but th that places the first transmembrane segment over here. The second one does not crosslink to asterisk, but to something slightly bigger, which turns out to be a component of the gel complex, the, the TMC01 subunit. And the third transmembrane segment crosslinks to the SEC61 complex. And depending on where you put the photo crosslinker, it crosslinks to either the alpha subunit or the beta subunit. Uh, the beta subunit is right here. This, I think, nicely illustrates how specific the photo crosslinking is. If you put the photo crosslinker on different faces of the helix, you can, you can probe different uh, environments. And I think it shows nicely that these crosslinks are incredibly specific. So we feel reasonably confident in drawing the substrate here. So what we think we're looking at is an intermediate in which the second and third transmembrane segments have just been inserted. And obviously, they are not at the lateral gate of SEC61. They're behind SEC61, adjacent to these poorly characterized complexes that form this horseshoe shape behind SEC61. 
And that's why we call this the multipass translocon because it seems to be involved in inserting multipass proteins. So the idea then is that after you insert the first transmembrane segment, the partial hydrophilic character of it uh, seems to play a role in recruiting the PAC complex, which seems to be co-recruited with these other two complexes, the gel and BOSS. And what the PAC complex does is it, it seems to lock SEC61 closed by wedging between SEC61 and the ribosome and pull the nascent chain behind SEC61. The consequence of that is that then as you make more segments of polypeptide, they get inserted behind SEC61. We think by homology, although this remains to be rigorously tested by mutagenesis, that this insertion reaction is mediated by the gel complex. And once you get that insertion, then you can imagine that as you synthesize more polypeptide, they can then continue to be inserted behind SEC61 until you make the whole protein, it folds. And once all the hydroph hydrophilic parts of the polypeptide are buried, then there's nothing for these complexes to bind to anymore, and, and we imagine that the complex disassembles and, you're, and you've made your protein. So this obviously is a completely different way of thinking about how membrane insertion works than the kind of sequential insertion via the lateral gate of SEC61. The first transmembrane segment is inserted by this protein complex called EMC, which isn't shown in this diagram, and then the later transmembrane segments of, of this GPCR are inserted by these other components behind SEC61. So none of them are inserted by the lateral gate of SEC61. So that makes a prediction, which is that if you block the lateral gate of SEC61, insertion of this GPCR should still work. And one thing that's happened in, in, in the past number of years is that there have been a number of really good inhibitors of the SEC61 lateral gate, and some really nice work by Enyong Park and, and, uh, uh, and Jack Taunton have now gotten structures of, of such inhibitors, and they basically bind right at the lateral gate and block it. And so um, we can then test this idea. So here's a positive control, which is a single pass protein that is known to insert via the lateral gate of SEC61, and um, this is a flow cytometry assay uh, in which the gray is, the, is, is, is um, control cells, no inhibitor, nothing knocked down. Obviously, if you knock down SEC61, insertion doesn't work, um, but if you add the in inhibitor of the lateral gate, insertion doesn't work as well. So that makes complete sense, but here's rhodopsin. Obviously, if you knock down SEC61, insertion doesn't work, but that's because the that's the binding site for the ribosome. So the ribosome has nothing to bind to with the membrane. But the inhibitor is completely ineffective against inhibiting rhodopsin insertion. It's, I have to say, surprisingly clean how, this, how good this result is. And we did this with three completely unrelated, chemically unrelated inhibitors. Um, and we've also done this with um, uh, multiple different uh, GPCRs. And so, this class of proteins doesn't seem to use the lateral gate of SEC61. So you might ask, what exactly is SEC61 needed for? Obviously, it's needed here in this case for um, binding to the ribosome and serving as a template to, to organize these other components that I described. But it turns out that if you're in the process of making a membrane protein, suppose that there's a loop in the middle that's really long. The components I told you about they are not well suited for translocating long segments of polypeptide. That's because they don't have a channel in them, like the channel that's in SEC61. And it turns out that if you have such a protein, and this is the C3A complement receptor, a GPCR that has such a long loop that's about 150 amino acids long, translocation of that loop requires SEC61. And here's the experiment to show it. So this protein has two glycosylation sites. And the second one is in this, sec in this loop. So here's an experiment without SEC61 inhibitor. You, the protein gets glycosylated once and twice right here. But if you have SEC61 inhibitor, the first glycosylation still occurs, and that's occurring at the N-terminus here. That's because that insertion is not SEC61 dependent. It, it's mediated by EMC. But the second one is preferentially gone. And that's because you cannot translocate that loop 
And we can then show this using protease protection because if you digest the samples with cytosolic protease, um, the first three transmembrane segments are protected from protease. That's what this little fragment here represents. And amazingly enough, if you shorten that loop to be about 20 or so amino acids, now, whether you have sex 61 inhibitor or not, insertion works perfectly fine. And so what one then is left with is this idea that the OXA family, which I remind you is conserved across all organisms, mediates insertion of transmembrane segments when the adjacent flanking domain is relatively short. And that's because they, it seems to work by using a vestibule, that is not a channel across the membrane. So it's just reducing the barrier to translocation, and there's a limit to what can be translocated across. And that limit, experiments by us and, 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 and others in E. coli uh, many years ago, seems to be about 50 amino acids. So transmembrane segments with a flanking domain of about 50 amino acids use the OXA1 family. And of course, I showed you that in, uh, in the mammalian ER, there are three family members, GET, EMC, and GEL. Um, bacteria have YIDC. The inner mitochondrial membrane has a protein called OXA1, and the inner chloroplast membrane has a protein called ALB3. So all these membranes that need to make membrane proteins have a member of this family. And so we believe that this family can also insert a pair of transmembrane segments as long as the loop between it is short. But if you need to get a long loop across the membrane, then you need a channel. And this is obvious because uh, you know, the energetic barrier to moving a long segment of polypeptide is simply too high, and you need an aqueous channel to move it across the membrane. And what we think happens is that the transmembrane segment adjacent to that long domain engages and opens the lateral gate, pulls the protein through this channel, and that's how you get the long loop across. So you know, if you look at the diversity of membrane proteins, as I showed you, what I think is going to happen, and we've tested parts of this, but not, not all, is that proteins that have a short segment that needs to be translocated across are inserted by an OXA family member. For example, this tail an anchored family is inserted by GET, or in some cases by EMC, and that's been rigorously demonstrated. Um, our GPCR, where all the parts that are across the membrane are short, are mediated by OXA family members, such as EMC for the first transmembrane segment and GEL for the others. And some proteins, such as this one, which represents a subunit of the, of the pentameric ion channel family, the first part of it is mediated by SEC. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a cleavable signal peptide that's encoded there. Other parts of it are mediated by OXA that are short. And so now, what started off as this sort of bewildering kind of diversity of membrane proteins, I think, can be simplified to a very simple concept, which is that evolutionarily, there are two classes of, of proteins. The OXA family, which is evolved for inserting hydrophobic segments coupled to translocation of a short element, and the SEC family, which is, as it says in the name, for secretion, and secretion being defined as moving a long segment of hydrophilic polypeptide across the lipid bilayer. And that obviously has to happen for some membrane proteins, but not others. And so, um, you know, I will leave it there and just remind you that we think that in all organisms, um, there would be these factors that mediate insertion of different parts of the membrane protein. And because, at least in the mammalian system that we've studied, these factors can be assembled in a context-dependent manner or a substrate-driven manner, um, you then have, as the polypeptide comes out of the ribosome, the capacity to use members of either family for insertion. And that seems to have been buttressed with other components, such as the PAC complex, that may facilitate chaperoning of the protein. And all of this occurs in this kind of very protected space behind SEC61, which is where we think the protein can fold without it being interfered with by um, you know, aggregation or, or interaction with quality control factors. And so the last thing I'll say is that, you know, that review I wrote kind of 25 years ago, the last figure in the review speculated about how this all might work. And although it was pure speculation, something you could do in reviews back then, um, we in fact speculated that there's no way it's possible for a small channel to insert so many membrane proteins. And Sandy Simon had some indirect evidence that there was 
the capacity to have multiple transmembrane segments that had not quite been inserted but somehow held in the membrane. And so we drew this very large kind of machine sitting on the ribosome. And what's, I have to say, completely satisfying, although I take no credit because it's a complete accident, uh, the size of this matches quite closely to the multipass translocon structure. So I will uh, leave it there and thank you for your attention. So that was a fantastic talk. I had two questions. So first one is that given the fact that the this system is dependent on the, high, the, the partial hydrophilicity of the, some of the transmembrane helices. And of course, there's a heterogeneity of that in the membrane protein world. Yeah. So you imagine that there's a heterogeneity of other chaperone proteins that come into play when different kinds of membrane proteins are um, inserted. That's the first question. The second one is that, I was curious, I mean, your photocross-linking system is very beautiful, but did you ever try to get some of the initial sort of data just using cross-linking mass spectrometry, um, and did you find anything? Yeah, great question. Um, so the first question, um, although there's a large diversity of hydroph hydrophobicity in the membrane world of, of transmembrane domains, almost all multipass proteins have either the first or second transmembrane domain as being relatively hydrophilic. And so that's kind of interesting because um, it does suggest that the PAC complex and these other components would get recruited quite early. But in hindsight, it's not that surprising. And the reason is because um, packing of multiple transmembrane segments into, into a bundle, which is what most membrane multipass membrane proteins do, is mediated primarily by either uh, short side chains like glycines or hydrophilic residues. And so I think that, I think that uh, their enrichment in multipass proteins makes sense. And then in terms of cross-linking mass spec, it's a good question. So uh, I, I didn't talk about some of the really nice work that um, Bob Keenan did, but Bob was focused on the gel complex a, a, and before we knew it was a complex. And he pulled on the, the, one of the subunits, TMCO1, and did mass spec and cross-linking mass spec. And so in hindsight, I think, you know, in, with the structures and things like that, one can kind of make a fair amount of sense of this. Um, but I think that it was a bit, uh, you know, difficult uh, without that um, to, a, a, as kind of a discovery vehicle. But yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, beautiful talk. Um, an oddly specific question. So I was really interested in this asterisk protein in the, the PAC complex, and it has this unique hydrophilic face. Have you studied how it's inserted in the membrane, and kind of what's the stability like if you have this one hydrophilic face that's really important for you know, anchoring these unique segments? Yeah, so I have to say that um, w what I showed, this beautiful hydrophilic face, that we have to remember, of course, that's a, that's a model. Um, and so one possibility is that there's a, there's a different conformation that obscures that hydrophilic face when it's not being used. And that's my favorite idea of what's happening. And so, um, and, and then, but, but we don't have any information about that. The other aspect of the question, it turns out that most, many proteins that are involved in biogenesis um, often need themselves to be made. So for example, SEC61, um, is going to use, uh, in part, SEC61 and these other components to be produced. And presumably, uh, Asterix will also need some of these components to be produced. And, and in the cytosol, for example, HSP70 probably needs HSP70 to make more copies yeah, of itself. Yeah, the chaperone helps the chaperone. But yeah, it's interesting, too. Do you think that's related, then, to the transition from early to late? Yeah, the transition from early to late is something we don't fully understand. Um, part, of the, part of the equation, clearly, is hydrophilicity of the early transmembrane segment of the substrate. Because if we, for example, make that hydrophobic, or like let's just ma say make it all leucines, then the PAC complex and the other complexes don't seem to get recruited for reasons that are not clear. So e even though they can all clearly bind the ribosome, that uh, affinity is evidently not enough to stabilize them there. Yeah, great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I would like to sneak in just one question from the, uh, here I am yeah. down here. Uh, this to be a quick question from the uh, online community. Um, how does the engagement between uh, SEC61 and hydrophobic segment coming out of the ribosome happen? Is there a signal or chemical reaction between the two that opens up the channel? Yeah. So this is, this is a great question. And 
although we have a snapshot of what it looks like after it's engaged, we do not know how SEC61 gets opened. Mm. Um, and so one possibility is that, is that maybe it initially kind of engages a little bit of the lateral gate that's partially cracked and sort of um, as more hydrophobicity of the nascent chain comes out, it sort of weaves into the lateral gate and forms a helix at the same time. But I have to say that these co-translational processes have been extremely difficult to study, and so we don't know what those intermediates look like. Okay. Yeah, great talk, Manu. If you have a, a relatively C-terminal transmembrane segment, which is attached to a large hydrophilic segment that has to be translocated into the lumen of the ER, and, and therefore uh, that particular transmembrane segment would go through the SEC61 channel, um, would there be a problem joining the N-terminal portion of the protein, which is associated with PAT, gel, and BOSS? Yeah. I, I, think that, um, I think that what needs to happen is the following, and we don't have evidence for this yet, but this is my favorite hypothesis. So remember that there are these two helices of the, of the PAT complex that wedge between SEC61 and, and the ribosome. I think that when you need to now use SEC61, those two helices have to move out of the way because otherwise there's no way you can open SEC61. And so the question is, how the, what is the trigger for that to happen? And we think that, so, so if you, I didn't go into the details of the structure, but the, but the end of that second, that, those two helices protrudes into the tunnel of the ribosome. So we think that the, PAC complex, specifically the, the, the CCDC47 subunit, can somehow sense what is coming out of the ribosome. And so once you start synthesizing a, a segment of hydrophilic polypeptide that eventually needs to be translocated across, my hypothesis is that it starts accumulating in this very limited space between the ribosome and the, and the uh, membrane components. And that displaces these two helices of, of the CCDC47, and that's what allows SEC61 to open. Uh, but this, I think, I think it's an attractive hypothesis, but we don't know how it happens. We do know that it happens, because we can design such substrates and show that it uh, does shift over from, from engaging the, the PAC complex to the SEC complex. Now, the, we don't think the PAC complex just diffuses away or disassembles because it's associated with the substrate. And that's why I focus on just movement of these, these helices out of the way to allow SEC to open. Yep. Uh, great talk. Uh, the question, though, is about uh, you started it with showing that the first transmembrane is inserted by the, uh, the EMC, and yet and showed also that the first transmembrane is very hydrophilic and it's stabilized with an interaction between SEC61 and PAT. So yep. how does it stabilize when it's inserted after the EMC? Yeah. So I think it may be that um, the time it is in the membrane is relatively short between when it's inserted by EMC and when it engages the, the PAT complex. And I forgot to mention, but the, or maybe I did mention in passing, but the PAT complex is fairly abundant as well. So we think that perhaps it simply just captures it fairly quickly and there isn't a big problem. Um, but the other more attractive idea, obviously, is that there's some kind of more precise handover from one complex to the other. Um, and I will say that when we first purified EMC for reconstitution studies and so forth, and we did mass spec on it, CCDC47 was one of the components. And so I, I've always liked this idea, however, uh, seeing a very abundant membrane protein in a mass spec experiment always makes me nervous. And so, so I've been hesitant to, to put too much stock in it. But yeah, that's what we think. Hey, so I have a more general question. I mean, after the first stage, you now have to transfer two transmembrane domains through the membrane. That still seems kind of painful. Is there any evidence or suggestion that perhaps the membrane composition in this area is different in some way to facilitate the transfer? Yeah, I, I personally really like this idea, but I cannot think of a good way to like test this carefully. Um, and, and I would love to hear suggestions. So there were it. no other proteins that mo might modify the composition that were purified in, in your scheme? 
No, not that we can think of. So, so, so what I sort of imagine is that, uh, is that the kind of, so, so I didn't show this, but the interior of this horseshoe cavity is partially hydrophilic and partially hydrophobic. It's very well conserved. So one possibility is that those properties recruit a certain subset of lipids that are stabilized there that facilitate the insertion. And I kind of like that idea. And maybe some type of lipid cross-linking type experiments could be done to see if there's something uh, non-bulk yeah. lipids that are there. Yeah. Yes. Thank and thank you very much, Manu, for giving a fantastic presentation. <laughs>